Well, good evening. Welcome back. We're glad you're in the service tonight. We're taking our Bibles, if you would, and going to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5 is our text tonight. It's a joy to be with you in the morning service, and we appreciate your faithfulness in being here tonight. Believe it or not, after tonight, we're halfway through. You say, how do you figure that? Well, we've got six services this week together, and we had three today, and we got Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday night. So day-wise, we're not halfway through, but services-wise, we are. So thank you for your faithfulness throughout the day. And we invite you to join us again tomorrow night at 7, Tuesday and Wednesday. And the meeting will come and go very quickly. So appreciate you making your plans to be here. Invite somebody else from the community to join us as the gospel is given and the word of God is shared. And we'll be praying with you that the Lord will use that to draw people to himself. Hope you have practiced the third ordinance of the Baptist this afternoon. You say, what's that? That's the afternoon nap, right? Grab that thing, study the back of your eyelids, make sure there's no leaks there, no holes. And uh, you're ready to go here for tonight. And we appreciate you being in the service. Galatians chapter 5, we're beginning our reading tonight in verse number 16. Paul writes, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do that which you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Look back at verse 16. The Bible says, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Tonight we're preaching on winning the war within. Let's ask the Lord to help us as we look into His Word together tonight. Father, we enter your gates with thanksgiving, your courts with praise. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, the sunshine to the day, and the rain that we've heard even earlier. You allow it to fall on both the just and the unjust. One more sign of your grace and your mercy that's bestowed upon all. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts tonight. May your word and your spirit have free course in this place. May we come receptive, responsive, and resolved to what you'd have for us. As believers, may we recognize that through the Spirit of God, We can win the war within through your power and for your glory. If one has joined us tonight in this service, and they've never truly, genuinely been born again, we pray this might be the time and the place where they trust Christ as their Savior. And we'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. There is an inward battle that continuously rages within the heart and life of every believer. It's a conflict between right and wrong, good and evil, between the flesh and the spirit. This war is unremitting. It is fierce. The flesh and the spirit are locked in active conflict, the one with the other, and neither one wants to surrender. And yet we'll learn from our text tonight that by walking in the spirit, it guarantees spiritual victory within and spiritual fruit without for each one of us as children of God. But before we can understand God's provision of spiritual victory, we've got to get a, a quick overview of what God is helping us understand through the book of Galatians. Uh, We've got to back up and kind of get an overview here, if we could, briefly. The churches of Galatia were filled with a a bunch of young Gentile believers. A Gentile is simply a non-Jew. Paul had come through that area of the world and preached the gospel of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And there were many who had placed their faith and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in Paul's absence, there was a group of religious leaders, Judaizers, who had come in and begun to teach something that was very distinctly different from what the Word of God had to say and what Paul had imparted as the truth of God to those young believers. They were being taught that salvation was through justification by faith plus works. They were being taught that in order to really be a Christian, they had to become Jewish. They had to be willing to be circumcised and adhere to the Mosaic law. So Paul is writing this letter back to denounce this deadly and and, uh, false doctrine. In the first couple of chapters, he wants them to understand his apostolic authority and the gospel message that he's preached. He once again reiterates that. 
In chapters 3 and 4, he explains and defends the doctrine of justification by faith alone. You know, salvation is not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus Christ alone. If you're relying on anything that you've ever done, you'll never step foot in heaven. For it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's according to His mercy that He saves us. Now in chapters 5 and 6, as Paul would often do after laying the doctrinal foundation, he talks to us about some practical tips for Christian living. He wants us to put it in to our life. And so that's where we're looking at today. Now we started in verse 16, but in the first few verses of chapter 5, Paul gives us and explains the positional and practical truth of the liberty that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful truth to get a hold of as a believer. You know, the book of Galatians has been called the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. It's been called the Christian's Declaration of Independence. Did you realize that when we get saved through salvation in Jesus Christ, we've been set free from the bondage of sin and the law? But Paul quickly wants us to help us understand we've got to defend our Christian liberty from two enemies that are out there. If Christian liberty is the the roadway we want to travel down, there's two ditches on either side that we've got to avoid. He warns us against the one ditch on one side, that would be legalism. The other ditch on the other side is license. You say, what are those? Well, legalism, by its strict definition, is adding works to grace. We looked this morning at God's amazing grace. That salvation is a gift from Almighty God that Jesus Christ has paid it all There's not one part of it that we earn or merit, and yet by faith we receive that gift of eternal life. So when someone says, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to try to go to church, I'm going to try to do this or that or stop this or join this or give this, and thinking that's going to merit eternal life, that's legalism. Now some people throw around that term legalism today and try to attach it to people that look into God's Word as believers and come up with some biblical principles by which they want to live by, That's not a legalist, that's a loyalist. That's someone who simply says, I've got some Bible convictions that I desire to live out for the glory of God. And yet if we think that somehow by keeping this list of do's and don'ts that merits favor with God, now we've gone into the ditch of legalism. He wants us to avoid that. You realize that Christian liberty frees us from the bondage of legalism. We're not accepted of God because of anything that we've done but solely on the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done, and by faith, receiving that gift of eternal life. That's one ditch to avoid, legalism. But there's another one that's prevalent today, and it's easy to get into the ditch of license. Here's where some take their Christian liberty and think that somehow it means they can live any way they want. They've got their ticket on their way to heaven, so anything goes. But real liberty comes when Christ frees us from sin. He didn't save us from sin so we could turn around and go right back living in sin. As we saw, it's the grace of God that teaches us this morning to say no to certain things and yes to other things so that we can live a life that is well-pleasing to Him. So Christian liberty, rightly understood, frees us from the power of sin and the law so that we can rather be free to serve out of a heart of love. Paul tells us that in verse 13 when he says, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. In fact, he says, if you'll choose out of love to serve Christ, you actually go above and beyond the law. He says in verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But he warns, because when our Christian liberty, when we think that somehow can be abused, it turns into a type of Christian cannibalism. He says in verse 15, But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. So, how do we stay on this pathway of Christian liberty and avoid the ditch of legalism and license? The answer is through the power of the Spirit of God. He alone allows us to have that balance to keep us on that straight and narrow road and enjoy the freedoms that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ while living a life that is well-pleasing to Him. So here in Galatians chapter 5, as we've begun in verse 16, we want to understand how to win the war within. Paul explains to us that, first of all, there's a conflict that goes on within the heart of every believer. He says in verse 17, The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. You know there's still being a civil war being fought? 
Not between the North and the South, okay? But it is between freedom and slavery. Between freedom and the Lord Jesus Christ and slavery to sin. You see, when you got saved, the Spirit of God comes and takes up residence within each and every one of us as believers. And when God the Spirit lives within us, there was an immediate conflict that arose when you got saved. Why? There was already a prior tenant living there. It's called our flesh. It's that part of us that wants nothing to do with God. In fact, it wants to live completely opposite of what the Spirit of God wants. So there's the old nature, our flesh, that's in conflict with our new nature and the Spirit of God. That's why as a believer, it, it feels sometimes like there's this internal tug of war that is going on. You know, that's a good sign that you genuinely belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. An unbeliever doesn't face that. They live in sin, go down through that. Now, they might be concerned that they get caught because of the consequences, but there's no heart that says this is displeasing to God and I don't want to dishonor Him and discredit Him. There's nothing of the Spirit of God inside of them that convicts and confronts and chastens. He says the flesh lusted against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. This word lust is the broad term. It carries the idea that it has direct opposite ideas. The flesh wants to lead us in one direction while the Spirit desires to lead us in another direction and that's why there's this internal conflict. Sometimes as a Christian, it feels like there's two giant sumo wrestlers trying to knock each other out of the ring on the inside. You know, the Apostle Paul could identify with that. Read Romans chapter 7 and see the internal struggle that he dealt with. Again, a good sign that we know Christ as our Savior. You see, the flesh desires to enslave us to sin, but the Spirit of God desires to free us so that we can serve out of a heart of love. Now, if you know the Bible, you understand that the Scripture warns us about our three enemies. They are the world, the flesh, and who, everybody? The devil, all right? Somebody called them the external foe. That's the world. The internal foe, that's the flesh. And the infernal foe, that is the devil. You know, if Christianity was simply stay away from the world and be aware of the devil, I don't think Christianity would be that difficult. We just go be, you know, recluse someplace, a monk somewhere, and just stay away from the world and not not have anything to do with that. But the problem is, it doesn't matter where you go, there's an enemy that tags along with you every place you go. It's our flesh. It's that part of us that wants nothing to do with the things of God. Years ago, there was a comic strip called Pogo the Possum. The fellow that was writing that made the phrase famous, we have met the enemy and he is us. You know, sometimes as a Christian, we're our own worst enemy, aren't we? That flesh so longs to go opposite of the things of the Spirit of God. I read years ago when Spurgeon had his preacher boy school, there was a young man that uh, was learning about a preaching, and he was very gifted. Problem was he knew it. He was very arrogant in his deportment, and Spurgeon had been working with him and was there one night as a young man began to preach through Ephesians chapter 6 on wearing the armor of God. He eloquently described how to wear the belt of truth and to put on the breastplate of righteousness and how to have your feet shod with the gospel of peace and picking up the shield of faith and putting on the helmet of salvation and how to wield the sword of the Spirit all in an attitude of prayer. And he boldly announced, I'm wearing the whole armor of God. Where is the enemy? Bring him on. And Spurgeon said, he's inside the armor. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy, aren't we? There is that flesh. It's mentioned five times in the verses that we read tonight. It's not talking about your, your hide and hair, skin and bones. It's talking about that old sinful nature. And sometimes we feel so overwhelmed by it that Paul would say in verse 17 that we cannot do the things that we would. You ever been there? Even in our best moments, we, we feel like we're constantly battling the flesh. But thank God we're not without help and hope in the Christian life. You see, the Spirit of God is mentioned seven times in this passage. And His ability to rout the flesh is constant and sure, but it can only be experienced as we learn how to walk in the Spirit, verse 16, so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there's a war that's going on. It's internal. It may be invisible. It may be secret between the old and the new nature. There's that internal conflict, and yet the words and deeds that erupt from within are outward and evident. So Paul goes from talking to us about the conflict to giving us a contrast. They say down south here, the proof is in the pudding. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I do like pudding, all right? But uh, I think it's the idea that if you want to know who's in control of your life, whether it's the flesh or the spirit, there's some evidences of that. 
Now, what Paul's going to do here in the next few verses is give us a list of vices, the works of the flesh, and contrast those with the virtues of the fruit of the Spirit. He wants us, evidently, as many ancient authors would do, they make these lists to compare and contrast. And he's doing that, so he begins in verse 19 by talking to us about the works of the flesh. So one commentator said, these are like a mirror. We look into them and we see the corruption of our own hearts. And we notice something right off the bat about these. He calls these the works of the flesh. The word works points to effort and strain and labor. These are deeds practiced by a person that has the flesh in control of their life. They're the works of the flesh. So if the flesh is in control, here's what it looks like. We read down through this list, even though it's not exhaustive, it comes at us in all kinds of chaotic form. That's exactly the way the flesh would manifest itself. So what does Paul say? He begins this list in verse 19. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. The word manifest means they're outward, they're open, they become apparent. If the flesh is in control of our life, what's it look like? He says, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. He begins down this list speaking of adultery, it's unfaithfulness to your spouse, it's marital infidelity. He says fornication, it's a broad term for any type of immorality. It's actually the Greek word pornea. We get the English term pornography from that. He says uncleanness, it's any thought, word, or deed that's impure or lewd. He says lasciviousness. It's a Bible term that means to act without restraint. We would say giving in to your animalistic desires. We might call that person today a party animal. It's a work of the flesh. He says idolatry. It's the worship of anything, anyone other than God. Witchcraft. He's not just talking here about the practice of evoking spirits or sorcery. It's actually the Greek word pharmakia. Sound familiar to you? We get the word pharmacy from that. You know what he's talking about? Drug abuse. If you paid attention to the news, I don't know how it is around here, but I can tell you Indianapolis, there's an epidemic of drug abuse. It is a work of the flesh. He says hatred and variance and emulation, people that cause all kinds of dissension and dislike, and they're quarrelsome. He says wrath and strife and seditions, people that would cause rebellion and promote all kinds of self-ambition. He says heresies and envyings and murders and drunkenness and revelings. And then he says, and such like. In other words, that list could just keep going and going and going. And then he uses a phrase in verse 21 that ought to strike fear into all of our hearts. He says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, well, why should that cause me concern? Because which of us has not seen the works of the flesh manifested in our life at some point? But when he says those which do such things are not going to heaven, shall not inherit the kingdom of God, he's not referring to an isolated instance. He's talking about a habitual lifestyle. Here's what he's saying. A person whose lifestyle, their habit, is identified as the works of the flesh. He says that person does not have the Spirit of God residing within them. We said there's going to be fruit that demonstrates whether or not we really have the Spirit of God living in our life. If our life is constantly pictured in the works of the flesh, and we see no victory over sin and no fruit of the Spirit being born out there, it's evidence that we don't genuinely belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how many verses you know. It doesn't matter how many times you've been to church. Friend, if you have the works of the flesh constantly and continuously abiding in your life without the Spirit of God chastening and correcting you, then the Bible says you don't have the Spirit of God living within you. This is what it looks like when the flesh is in control. It's dark and it's dirty and it's hopeless, but he wants to give us a contrast. He says, the works of the flesh are, now in verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is. He wants us to be able to take a walk through the garden of God. A number of years ago, when my wife and I had been dating for a little while, I decided, I want to ask this girl to marry me. In school and Bible college, there was a fellow that would come through from time to time, and he sold diamonds. He'd rent a hotel room high up in the building, big window, light coming through there, and he would show off those, those different diamonds. I remember walking in and sitting down across from him, and he was showing some of these large rocks. I said, man, I'd love to buy Tara that. How much is it? He told me. I said, oh, and I'm a Bible college student. I can't afford that. 
here's my budget. What will that buy? So he gets out the tweezers, you know, and he reaches down in the bag. And he pulls out this little speck of a rock. And uh, what he'll do so you can see that is often they'll take a black piece of velvet. You ever see him do this at the jeweler? And they'll set that down. And they'll put that diamond on top of there so that when the sunlight hits it, it shows off all the facets, as small as it may be, of that diamond. You know, that's kind of what God has done for us here in his word. He's taken us through the muck and the mire of the works of the flesh, and now with that black backdrop, he wants to show off the beauty of the facets of the fruit of the Spirit. And we notice something immediately by way of contrast here. He says this is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not works. Works are naturally practiced by us. But fruit has to be supernaturally produced in us. He says this is the fruit of the Spirit. In other words... He's the source, we're the channel. It's not Ben's fruit. It's not your fruit. It's the Spirit's fruit. He, through His grace and for His glory, allows that to be borne out in our life. It's the fruit of the Spirit. That word fruit is intentionally singular. You ever hear somebody say the fruits of the Spirit? Eh, wrong. Read your Bible. Every word's important, singular and plural. You say, well... It says fruit, but then he lists off nine of them. So how can it be singular? Well, I think there's a purpose behind that. And that is the Spirit of God has one goal for each one of us as believers. You know what that goal is? Christ-likeness. He's conforming us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does Christ-likeness look like? It looks like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, he says, there is no law. There's a unity of purpose here. So it's not as if you're looking at a string of pearls and each one of them individually, but rather it'd be kind of like in, in the language of, of, of fruit, an orange, and you're dissecting each of those different segments. One fruit, but it's multifaceted that way as God brings it forth in our life. So here's the question tonight. Which would you rather see? Which would you rather see in your life? The works of the flesh that destroy relationships or the fruit of the Spirit that nurture and grow relationships? You say, well, that's a no-brainer. As a Christian, I long to see and desire to see the fruit of the Spirit born out in my life. You know, I think one of the reasons that God even calls it the fruit of the Spirit, there's something irresistible about fruit. I'm glad to be back in South Carolina. I've been craving some peaches, and it seems like about this time of year they're, they're coming in pretty good. I'm not sure exactly what part of the state. I know when we were in the upstate, you could get a hold of some of those. There's nothing better than fresh fruit. Enjoy the different produce items that are there. Now, some people will pass up dessert in order to enjoy fruit. Smart people put the fruit on top of the ice cream and eat it that way. But some will pass up dessert in order to enjoy fruit. There's something irresistible about that. I think that may be one of the reasons that God describes it as the fruit of the Spirit. So if you're like me, and we're looking into this passage of Scripture, and I'm understanding, all right, I, I, I understand there's a conflict going on. I don't want to see the works of the flesh. I want to see the fruit of the Spirit. I desire those. How do I get that? Well, that leads us to the next big question here. How do I experience this fruit in my life? And the answer is found in the one singular command given to us in this passage. It's back up in verse 16. See what Paul says? He says, walk in the Spirit. That's the command. And you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know what's real tempting for us to do? And that is to look at these nine evidences that we call the fruit of the Spirit and so long for them and desire them that we try to work them up of our own accord. But there's something interesting about fruit. You can't manufacture that. They've got some new businesses moving here and here, and they're making all kinds of things. But you're not going to find a fruit factory, okay? They can't do that. It's organic. God alone can produce fruit, physically and spiritually as well. Maybe you've been to somebody's house and you saw a, a bowl of, you know, a centerpiece there, a bowl of fruit, you thought, that looks good, and you walked over and picked it up, it was plastic. That's about as good as man can do right there. All we can do is manufacture plastic fruit. And sometimes we try to do this in our spiritual life. We think, boy, oh, I, I need that agape love, so I'm going to try to work on that. Boy, I need, yeah, I need some more self-control. Yes, I need long-suffering. You should meet my family members. Oh, boy, I, I, I need, I mean, we look at these things and think, yeah, I need these things in my life, and we try to work them up out of self-effort, and yet that's not the way to have spiritual fruit. 
It's the natural byproduct of doing Galatians 5.16. Walk in the Spirit. And you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, the Christian life is not just a work. It's a walk. It's walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not what you do that ought to make you who you are, but who you are in Jesus Christ that ought to dictate what you do. So the secret to spiritual victory and spiritual vitality is the Holy Spirit of God. If we're going to win the war within, we've got to understand how to practice Galatians 5, 16. We've got to walk in the Spirit. Now, if you're like me, and again, I'm studying this passage, I'm saying I don't want works of the flesh. I want to see fruit of the Spirit. I need to walk in the Spirit. Great, I'm going to do that. How do I do that? Well, you know, when God gives us a command in one portion of Scripture, and it may be a little fuzzy in our thinking, More often than not, he's clarified that for us in another parallel passage of Scripture. Because the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. All right? So we're going to do a quick study here to understand this phrase. Because if we don't understand what it means to walk in the Spirit, we're going to miss everything that God wants for us here tonight out of Galatians chapter 5. So turn over, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. And let's see what the Word of God has to say in Ephesians chapter 5. In Galatians 5, he says, walk in the Spirit. Literally, keep walking in the Spirit in the Spirit. Now in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he says in verse number 18, be not drunk with wine where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. All right, so to the Galatians he said, walk in the Spirit. To the Ephesians he says, be filled with the Spirit of God. Literally, be being filled. It's allowing the Spirit of God to have control of our life. You say, well, what's it look like when somebody allows the Spirit of God to have control of their life? Well, he kind of gives us some help here. In verse 18, he says, don't be drunk with wine or is an excess. We know what it looks like when somebody is under the influence of unclean spirits of alcohol, right? He says, stay away from that. Rather, you need to be under the control of the Spirit of God. What's it look like when somebody is yielded their life to the Spirit of God? He gives us some evidences. He says in verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Did you know that one of the evidences of a spirit-filled, spirit-controlled believer is singing? Did you know that? Something is wrong in the heart and the life of a believer that when it's time to stand as a congregation and sing praises to the Lord, something inside of them says, I'm not doing that. Something's wrong there. Because a spirit-controlled, spirit-filled believer is one that the psalmist would say he's put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Now, I'm glad the psalmist said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It didn't say make a beautiful noise, okay? Maybe you're not choir material. That's all right, but you can certainly do your best to make a joyful noise unto the Lord after all he's done for us. One of the evidences is singing. There's another one that's found In verse number 20, he says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, singing is an evidence of spirit-filled believer. Thanksgiving is an evidence of a spirit-filled believer. For a Christian, that's not just one Thursday in November that that ought to happen. There ought to be an attitude of gratitude overwhelmed by God's grace and His love and His mercy that's been bestowed upon us and rejoicing in that on a daily basis. They're singing, there's thanksgiving, In verse 21, he says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There's three evidences of a spirit-controlled believer. Singing, thanksgiving, submitting. And then he goes on to explain what this looks like in human relationships. He says in verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. He says in verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He says in chapter 6 and verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. He says in verse 4, You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. He says in verse 5 of chapter 6, Servants, be obedient unto them that are your masters. He says in in verse number uh, 9, Ye masters, do the same thing unto them, forbearing, threatening. So, here's what he says. When people are spirit-controlled, spirit-filled, they'll be singing, thanksgiving, and submitting. Wives submitting to husbands, husbands loving wives, children obeying parents, parenting, rearing children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It looks like employers doing right by employees and employees doing right by employers. You say, that sounds like heaven on earth. Exactly. When the Spirit of God is in control of our lives, this is what it ought to look like. You say, okay, I need to be filled with the Spirit of God. 
I need to walk in the Spirit. It looks like singing and thanksgiving and submitting, but I'm still not exactly sure how to do this. One more passage, and we'll put it all together, right? Colossians chapter 3. In fact, we'll start in chapter 4 and kind of work our way backward. Remember what he said to the, to the Galatians? He said, walk in the Spirit. That's active. Keep walking in, in the Spirit. To the Ephesians, he said, allow the Spirit of God to have control of your life. Be being filled with the Spirit. Now, in the book of Colossians, I want us to see some parallels here because he's, he's really talking to us about the same subject. He's coming at a little different angle now. Let's start in chapter 4, and let's see if we can find some of these same evidences. He says in chapter 4 and verse 1, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. He says back in chapter 3 and verse 22, Servants, obey in all things your masters. He says in verse 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Verse 20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is... Well-pleasing unto the Lord. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Verse 18, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit to the Lord. We just read that somewhere, didn't we? Sounds a whole lot like Ephesians, doesn't it? There's that aspect of submitting. Let's see if we can find thanksgiving, that evidence. He says to us in verse 17 of chapter 3, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. There's two out of the three. How about singing? Can we find it? Middle of verse 16 teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. There's those same three evidences. Singing, thanksgiving, submitting. But notice something. He changes his phrasing in Colossians 3 and verse 16. To the Galatians, he said, walk in the Spirit. To the Ephesians, he says, be filled with the Spirit. To the Colossians, he says in verse number 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So when we put it all together, we recognize walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, and letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly, they're all talking about the exact same thing. Two of the verbs are active. One of them is passive. You say, help me out with that. Here's what it means. It means we have to actively fill our minds with God's Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it be at home in your life. We have to actively walk in obedience to those truths. Walk in the Spirit. And then we allow passively, allow the Spirit of God to have control to guide and direct us by His Word. Actively putting the Word of God in. Actively living in obedience to it and then allowing the Spirit of God to guide and direct us by His Word. You say, well, that could be a little scary. Is it going to send me some weird direction? No. The, where the Spirit of God leads will be in accordance to the Word of God. Now, there are some that will try to tell you, well, I've been praying about this, and I have a peace in my heart, and I know it doesn't line up with the Word of God, but God is directing me to go do this, or start this, or be a part of this, and it's contrary to the Word of God. The, the Spirit of God is never going to lead you to do something contrary to the Word of God. You say, why is that? He wrote it. He's not going to contradict himself, okay? So if you're praying about something, I don't care how much peace you've got in your heart and how many times you prayed about it, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you better get back into the book and understand His Spirit always directs us through His Word. He'll never lead us to do something that contradicts the Word of God. So being Spirit-filled and being Word-filled are one and the same. So let me try to put it into something you can take home with you tonight. If you, miss, if you get nothing else, don't miss this, okay? What's it mean to walk in the Spirit? It means allowing the Spirit of God to take the Word of God to make me more like the Son of God. It's allowing the Spirit of God to take the Word of God to make me more like the Son of God. Go back, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5, and we'll wrap things up here tonight. We're wanting to know how to win the war within. There's a conflict going on. Flesh versus Spirit. Spirit certainly has the ability and the power to overcome the flesh, but the only way that can happen is if we learn to walk in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. When the flesh is in control, it looks like the works of the flesh. When the Spirit is in control, it produces, He produces the fruit of the Spirit. What's it mean to walk in the Spirit? Allow the Spirit of God to take the Word of God to make me more like the Son of God. So he says in Galatians 5 and verse 16, walk in the Spirit. If you look down in verse 25, he's going to say, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. 
Now, this word walks a little bit different than the one he used up in verse 16. This word here carries the idea of keeping in step with, staying in time with. You ever seen some of these college uh, marching bands? Sometimes they're out there at halftime in the football season and things. It amazes me, one, that you can play the instrument, and then two, to walk around with it, much less not run into everybody else and form all these different shapes that they do. It takes some talent and a lot of practice to do that, but they've got to stay in time, stay in step with the person conducting all of that. I do some jogging. It's not because I like to jog. It's because I like to eat. That's the problem, so I have to do some jogging. Sometimes I'd rather run out outdoors if the weather's permitting and there's a place to do that, but sometimes you end up indoors on a treadmill. I call them a dreadmill. You ever been on those things? All right. And here's what happens if you're walking or running on one of those. One of two things. You, you, you set the speed that you want to go, and one, you keep up, or two, it shoots you off the back end of that thing, doesn't it? You become a YouTube clip for somebody to laugh at later down the road there. Uh, here, here's what God is helping us understand. The Spirit of God is actively at work in our lives as believers. He wants us to keep He's working and moving us forward to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, produce this spiritual fruit, but we've got to keep up. You say, how do I do that? By obedience to His Word. By dependence upon His strength, by faithfulness in our time in God's Word and in prayer and in fellowship with other believers in this place. I wonder, are you keeping up with that which God is desiring to do in your life? So there's a conflict, flesh versus spirit. How do I know which one's in control? (laughs) There's a contrast. Works of the flesh show the flesh is in control. Fruit of the Spirit demonstrates the Spirit of God is in control. How do I allow the Spirit of God to have control? Allow Him to take the Word of God to make us more like the Son of God. Walk in the Spirit. And here's the wonderful truth of Galatians 5.16. There's a conquest. There's a victory that can be known. He says if you'll walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Here's how you win the war within. If you can get a hold of this truth, it'll help you. It certainly helped me in my Christian life. So many times I would see the works of the flesh popping up in my life, and it was kind of like playing whack-a-mole. You ever done that at the arcade? You know, you got that, that mallet, and these things pop up. And you're... you feel like you do that just the rest of your life, just beating up the flesh. Stop that, quit that, you got to stop that. You'll wear yourself out and never get ahead, never have spiritual victory doing that. He said, that's not the way to spiritual victory. He says, if you'll choose to walk in the Spirit, here's the promise. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, when he makes that promise, he uses a a double negative in the Greek language. Now, a double negative in our minds makes a positive, but that's not the way it worked in Greek. A double negative was the most emphatic way they could say something. Here's what he's saying. Walk in the Spirit, and you cannot, you will not. It is an impossibility for you to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So explain that. Well, remember, the the flesh desires to take us this direction, and the Spirit desires to take us 180 degrees the other direction, doesn't it? So instead of just trying to beat up the flesh, he says, quit doing that and turn your back to it and begin to walk in the Spirit. And by walking in the Spirit, you cannot, you will not. It's an impossibility to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And as a bonus, when you begin to walk in the Spirit, not only is there spiritual victory, but all of a sudden there's fruit that's produced in your life. All of a sudden you begin to see love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These things that begin to be produced in your life through the Spirit of God. Can I ask you tonight? As you examine your life, the tree of your life, do you see the spiritual fruit growing there? You know, when the Spirit of God comes and lives within us, and that happens at salvation, He's going to begin to produce that spiritual fruit in us. It might be small and gradual growth, but there will be some growth. If you examine your life and there's an absence of spiritual fruit there, that could mean that's because there's an absence of spiritual root there. No root no fruit. Has there been a time and a place in your life that you were genuinely born again? One of the most frustrated people in the planet you'll meet is someone who's trying to produce this spiritual fruit by their own willpower, and they've never genuinely been born again. 
They think somehow they can muster this up and wonder why they fail time after time after time. You don't get the ability to live for God until God comes and lives within you. Has that happened to you? Have you genuinely been born again? You know, Christian, if we would see a, a wonderful harvest of spiritual fruit, if we would win the war within, if we would recognize and realize spiritual victory, then we've got to learn to practice Galatians 5.16. Walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. As we walk in the Spirit, the flesh is subdued, and the spiritual fruit begins to be produced in us, that others may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Walk in the Spirit, and you can win the war within. Lord, thank you for your word, the way it is practical to our lives. Thank you for the Spirit of God and the Word of God who is able to make us like the Son of God. Lord, our desire as believers is that each day we'd be changing and conforming more to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm going to ask you some final questions tonight. I wonder if there's some, someone tonight that would say, Brother Ben, would you pray for me? As I examine my life, I'm concerned because there's an absence of spiritual fruit there. In fact, if I really am honest and look at my life, I see much more the works of the flesh produced and little to none of the fruit of the Spirit. It concerns me. If there's no fruit, that could mean there's no root. And I've been concerned about this, but tonight I need to get it settled. I'm not certain that I'm on my way to heaven. I don't have a Bible confidence that I'd spend eternity in heaven with God. But I'm concerned about my soul. Would you please, please pray for me? It'd be my privilege to do that. Would not embarrass you for anything in the world, but I wouldn't know you had that need unless you'd share it with me. In just a moment, by just lifting your hand high enough so I can see it. You lift it, I'll see it and say thank you, and you can put it back down. Please pray for me. I'm concerned. I do not know that I'm on my way to heaven, but I'm concerned about my soul. If God is speaking to your heart about that tonight. Would you just lift your hand high enough so that I can see it? I'll see it and say thanks. You can put it back down. Please, please pray, for, pray for me. Please pray for me. I'm just not certain that I'm on my way to heaven, but I'm concerned. Christian, how about you? Are you winning the war within? Are you allowing the Spirit of God take the word of God to make you more like the son of God do you see this spiritual fruit being born out in your life I wonder how many might say I, I certainly have room to grow and I desire to continue but I believe I could honestly say I'm living Galatians 5 16 I'm walking in the spirit so that I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh I'm allowing the spirit of God to take the word of God to make me more like the son of God and that's true of me as a believer tonight that's true of you as a believer. Would you just lift your hand up and then back down? That's true of me. I'm living Galatians 5, 16. Wonderful, wonderful. wonder how many tonight might say, God has spoken to my heart as a Christian. I don't want to live a defeated Christian life. Victory is assured through the power of the Spirit of God. I want to win the war within by walking in the Spirit. By God's grace beginning tonight, I want to allow the Spirit of God Take the word of God to make me more like the son of God. If God's spoken to your heart about that as a believer tonight, would you just slip your hand up and then back down? God spoke to me about that. He dealt with me. Yes, yes, you put your hands down. Can we quietly stand to our feet, please? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. In a moment, we'll have an invitation hymn be played. Friend, if you're here tonight and you've joined us, but you're not certain that you're on your way to heaven, would you come and allow someone to take a Bible for a moment and show you from God's word? How you can leave here tonight with a Bible certainty that heaven will be your eternal home. Christian, as God has spoken to your heart, the invitation is open for you to do business with him. Come and find a place around the front to kneel or be seated. If need somebody to pray with you, we'd be glad to find a personal worker to do that. As the instruments begin to play right now and God has spoken to your heart, would you respond? I want to be a Galatians 5.16 believer. I want to allow the Spirit of God to take the Word of God make me like the Son of God. I need to walk 
in the spirit. If I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We'll play through another stanza and the pastor will come and close our service in a moment as he sees. series on Galatians sometime if I have a chance to do that. But I uh, do appreciate the emphasis and very practical tonight. And I trust that, uh, that God will work in your heart. You know, if we had a church full of folks who walked in the Spirit, we're not perfect people, but if we walk in the Spirit, produce the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to impact the community around us. It's going to be noticed. I trust God moved in your heart tonight. I trust that, that He'll use that. Let's go ahead and be dismissed tonight in prayer. And uh, Mr. Yandel, could you pray for us tonight?